what do you all know about the French Revolution? And I ask this question with the caveat that like, I realize that for um, most of you, high school was probably disrupted for at least a year or two, right? And there was probably, there, there were some things that don't seem to have gotten covered. Um, you know, for example, in my Comp 2 class yesterday, one girl told me that her American history lessons basically stopped with the French and Indian War, which happened before the United States was actually founded. So, yeah. Um, so my, my expectations here are just to, to gauge what you know, right? Not to, you know, come down on you for not knowing things, right? So what do you know about the French Revolution? Yes, Peyton. It was the capture of the king and Marie, the queen, <laughs> basically. Um, uh -huh. And they tried to kill them, basically, so then they could overrule it. And uh -huh. be, like, you know, so the people could rule it. Okay, yeah, that's that's certainly Edmund Burke's understanding. Of yes. That, right? <laughs> and a, as we will note as we go through these, Burke's depiction of events isn't entirely accurate and is written to serve a particular agenda. Um, but um, then again, you know, so Wollstonecraft is also trying to advance a particular agenda. It's just a different agenda from Burke's. Um, but yeah, um, so, and I think that Burke's depiction of events has really kind of colored the way we perceive the French Revolution historically, right? Mm -hmm. Because his text is so widely circulated and becomes so influential. Um, not to mention that Burke is actually writing before the revolution uh, descended into the mo its most extreme forms of violence. Mm -hmm. So in 1791, uh, 1791 when he's writing, um, it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion this is going to end in violence, chaos, and then tyranny. Mm -hmm. That is what happens. But no one knows yet that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, Kaylee. Uh, also, like their Declaration of the Rights of Men closely mirrored a lot of ideals in like the American, like the Declaration of yeah. Independence, and sort of like uh -huh. unalienable rights and all these sorts of things. And then it turned into a lot of like people were really afraid of anyone who like seemed to hold fast to any idea of an aristocracy or a monarchy. And so there was a lot of people yeah. that ended up dying and not really fair trials in a lot of situations yeah. and just like, you're a traitor. And, and, I, and I think a lot of it is like the same, there's a similar kind of paranoia in revolutionary France that we've already talked about in Britain as regarded uh, Catholics, right? That you know Catholics in Britain were not trusted because they were, it was believed they might be in league with foreign powers. And during the early years and months of the revolution, you know, the king was in touch with his brothers and his relatives um, in other countries, trying to get them to, to convince them to come in and uh, you know, say, you know, rescue him from prison in Paris and impose you know, their authority on the people. So the people, so, the measures that we're talking about were imposed because the people were genuinely paranoid about um, their government being able to withstand an assault from outside, right? Not to mention that Marie Antoinette was an Austrian princess and that her relatives were not pleased about what was happening. Like there's you know, a whole kind of reaction in Europe from countries where the old aristocracies still held power, like one, they're afraid this could happen in their countries too. And, you know, they're also like, how should I put this? So, one thing about aristocracies, particularly royal families, is that by the 18th century, they kind of form a nationality unto themselves, right? They're more closely related to each other than they are to the people they rule through various kinds of intermarriage, right? Um, so for example, you know, the rulers of Spain in the 17th and 18th century were um, a German family called the Habsburgs, who were also like another branch of the family who ruled Austria. Um, so <clears throat> everybody who sits on a throne is, you know, a cousin um, or a brother 
or sister of someone else who sits on a throne somewhere else. So yeah, so there there is this kind of this paranoia among aristocrats that this is going to happen to us soon too, right? So anything else you guys know or um, know about the revolution or any other kind of prior opinions you have about the revolution? Okay. So I do want to note something quickly, actually, kind of based on what you said, Kaylee, about the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, right? Is that the idea of the citizen actually kind of emerges out of the French Revolution, our modern idea of the citizen. So prior to the late 18th century, the word that was usually described, someone who lived under the rule of any particular king or prince, was subject. And what does it mean to be subject to someone? If you are someone's subject. Yeah, go ahead. Like under someone's rule and authority? Yeah. If you are someone's subject, then they expect things out of you, right? You have certain responsibilities to them, right? You have obligations to them. Have any, have any of you seen Hamilton? Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's the, the bit where King George is saying, you know, in a, you know no, don't change the subject, because yeah. you're my favorite subject, yeah. my loyal, royal subject, forever and ever and ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a kind of playing on that idea, right? Mm -hmm. So how is a citizen different from a subject? Any guesses? Yeah. It's probably like the exact opposite, like this, the government now has to do things for the citizen as opposed to the citizen doing things for the Yeah, government. like it's not quite the complete opposite, right? The citizen does still have some obligations to the state, but it's a more reciprocal relationship, right? The state also has obligations to the citizen. So not only do you have obligations, you also have rights now. The state is expected to do things for you and also to respect particular boundaries as regards you, right? Now the other linguistic shift, the other change in language we see around the revolution is the very meaning of the word revolution. So when you hear the word revolution, what do you take it to mean? Okay, it's a change, right? And what kind of change uh, is a revolution usually? Like the overthrow of the government? Okay, yeah, it's the overthrow of the, yeah. the overthrow of the existing order, right? Yeah. And is it usually peaceful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually today use the word revolution to mean a kind of violent or chaotic upheaval, right? That throws over the old status quo and introduces something new, right? And it's really the French Revolution that gives us this particular idea, right? Revolution, prior to this, usually meant something more like, well, like literally it means a turn, right? So like a revolution of the globe. And in political terms, it usually meant return to a prior state. So last time we mentioned, or maybe, maybe it wasn't last time, maybe it was the first session, we mentioned the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Does anybody remember what we said about that? Or anything about that? What happened in the Glorious Revolution?
think about it in the context of why the British was, were suspicious of Catholics. Or one of the reasons they were suspicious of Catholics. Yeah, Kaylee. Was this with like the Stuart family and the Catholic sympathizers and them going back and yes, forth? Yes, exactly. The this was yeah, in the Glorious Revolution, the Catholic James II was overthrown in favor of his Protestant daughter and son-in-law, right? William III and Mary II, who ruled jointly until Mary died four years later. Poor Mary. All right, but <clears throat> in this case, right, revolution meant return to a prior state because you had an aberration, right, a Catholic monarch, right, a deviation from the norm being replaced by a Protestant king and queen, right? So it was meant to be a kind of return to normalcy, right? This was how it was seen. So there was a revolution in that sense, right? And when Burke uses the word revolution, on page 200, uh, 201, in his description of Marie Antoinette, he's also talking about a turning, right, rather than a violent over there. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with, it is now 16 or 17 years since I saw the Queen of France. I will. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. It is now 16 or 17 years since I saw the Queen of France, the Dauphiness at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch on what delightful vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she just began to move in glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Oh, what a revolution, and what in heart must I have to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall. Little did I dream when she added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom. Little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fall upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and cavaliers. I thought 10,000 swords must have leaped from the scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. But the age of chivalry is gone. All right, we can stop there, right? Okay. Um, so in this sense, he's like revolution is something almost like the turning of a planet, right? Or the, the orbit of a star, right? Moving around the heavenly spheres, which, you know, by Burke's time, people already realized wasn't actually how, like, the planet, you know, the stars don't actually move. In relation to us, we move in relation to them, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what else do we get from this description? What, what, what can we tell about Burke's values here from this? Yeah, go ahead. That he kind of defines chivalry as like protecting that tradition and like uh -huh. what has always been known. Okay. Yeah, it's what chivalry right, involves the protection of tradition on the one hand, right? And I think it's also probably worth noting that the word chivalry comes from the French word chevalier. And does anybody know what a chevalier is? Chevalier is the French word for knight. Hmm. So the word chivalry really does kind of refer to aristocratic male behavior, right? A kind of code of behavior that's expected of the highest class, of, the highest social class of men. And <clears throat> when he talks about the age of chivalry being gone here, right, what's his evidence that the age of chivalry is gone? that they captured not just the king, but they got her too, like when they came in storming. Yeah, that no one's no one stepped up to protect the queen, right? right? So not only is chivalry about the protection of like these aristocratic traditions, right? It's also supposed to be about um, you know the protection particularly of aristocrat beautiful aristocratic women.
So it's setting up a kind of gender dichotomy here that thinkers like Wollstonecraft, who was a pioneering feminist, challenge, right? Where women are weak and beautiful and are supposed to be protected. And men are supposed to be strong and stoic and are supposed to do the protecting, right? This is preceded by a description of the feelings of the king, which is like, how, how, how does Bert know how the king felt, right? You know, can't read his mind. Um, but yeah, I think like that this particular paragraph, this is one of the best known paragraphs in the piece. And um, it gives us a lot of insight, I think, into the kind of value system that Burke is defending here, right? The kind of value system that he is invested in. And I think it's also worth noting here, like, what does he think is most valuable or was most valuable about Marie Antoinette? Where did her value lie? Yes. Yes, she is valuable because she was beautiful, right? This is one of the things that Mary Wollstonecraft is going to take Burke to task for, right? Is the way a lot of his political opinions seem to be based on aesthetics rather than on reason, right? What kind of world does he think is more beautiful, at least for the few, right? Versus what kind of world is actually more equitable for ordinary people? So I think it's probably worth going back for a second and describing the basic situation that Burke is writing about here um, and the specific event he's responding to, how it came about. So does anybody have does anybody know what caused the French Revolution? Yeah, go ahead, Peyton. I know the like the workers were in extreme poverty and the uh -huh. king they were kind of ignoring it. Like they didn't yeah. really care about it. And it got so bad that they felt they had to do something about it. Yeah, massive inequality is one of the big drivers mm -hmm. um, of the revolution. And um, the fact that the aristocracy was basically completely out of touch, right, with the needs of ordinary people. So um, that is one of, like, particularly in most American popular history, that's kind of noted as the main pressure here, right? But like most complex historical phenomena, right, there is no single identifiable cause. Rather, it's this kind of um, con um, conjunction of calamities that all seem to come about around the same time, right? So some of the causes are specifically economic, and some of them were out of the king's control. So on the one hand, you had rapid population growth in the 18th century in France especially in Paris. So suddenly there are a lot more people clamoring for the same number of resources, right? You also had a decade of poor harvests throughout the 1780s. Right, so in 1789, when the dam finally bursts, this is after 10 years of hunger and starvation, right? So <clears throat> the poor harvests resulted in kind of mass movements of people into cities which were already overcrowded. You know, kind of like if you think about like our housing crisis in the U.S. right now, right? Like our problem is we simply don't have enough housing in places where there are jobs for everyone who wants or needs to live there, right? There's a similar kind of thing happening 
but because there were no zoning laws, people would just kind of put up put up shacks or um, you know you know cluster you know a dozen people into a house, right? There was also an extremely inefficient and unfair system of taxation. in which the rich and the church manage to escape most forms of taxation. And the burden of taxes largely fell on people in the educated middle class. There was also a massive financial crisis in 1789 that was precipitated in part by the Crown's need to pay for a series of wars with England and other European powers, right? And just to give you some sense of how deep Anglo-French rivalry ran, I'm just going to run down for you all of the different wars that Britain and France fought against each other in the 18th century. So, we have the War of Spanish Succession. From 1702 to 1713. We have the War of Austrian Succession. From 1744 to 1748. There's the Seven Years' War. From 1756 to 1763. In the US, we call this the French and Indian War. And we often don't realize that it's just part of a larger geopolitical conflict between Britain and France that's going on in other stages around the globe. For example, they were also fighting each other in India same time. And then we have the Anglo-French War from 1778 to 1783. And again, our revolution, at least from the European perspective, was another skirmish in this long-running fight between the British and the French, right? We were fighting as a kind of proxy French army in um, North America. And war costs a lot of money, right? And if you've got poor harvests and a badly managed economy, uh, chances are that's going to take its toll. Now, there are also political causes. So. There was an advisory body to the king, kind of similar to the British Parliament, called the Estates General. And it was made up of representatives from uh, a group known as, like, groups that were called the Three Estates, right? So France, French society was still organized based on a kind of medieval system of the division of labor, right? The first estate. were called the oratores. Those who prayed, right? So the church. The second estate the bellatores. Right, that's Latin for those who fight. It's a reminder that in their origins, right, European aristocracies were military, right? It was about, you know, you know, being able to feel the mounted knights. So the second estate is the nobility. The third estate, the laboratores, 
were those who work. And who do you think made up that particular group? Yeah, basically anybody who wasn't a noble or a priest, right? This was everybody else. Now, in terms of <clears throat> numbers here, there were about 100,000 French people who were members of the first estate. About 400,000 nobles, right? So about 100,000 priests in France, about 400,000 nobles, and roughly 27 and a half million other people who didn't belong qualify for either of these two groups, right? Now, how do you think representation in the Estats General was divided up? Most of it for the first estate, like most of the representation. That's a good instinct because you already know that it's, this, the answer is going to be it's unfair. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Think about the way our Senate is apportioned, right? So hardly anyone lives in Wyoming, right? But how many senators do they have? Lots of people live in Texas, but how many senators do they have? Okay. So if I tell you the Estates General were apportioned the same way, what does that tell you about how many representatives relative to each other each group had? Was it proportional or was it equal? Actually, yeah, it was equal, right? In that each group had the same number of representatives, right? Which meant that like Wyoming, the first estate was way overrepresented. And like Texas, the third estate was underrepresented. So, because each estate was represented equally, the first and second estates could always gang up to outvote the third estate. So, here's what happens in 1789 and 1790. So, <clears throat> the Estates General are called to deal with this financial crisis. Um, and many of the third estate representatives are barred from the chamber because they don't want to go along with the overall plan. So on June 20th, 1789, they gathered to take what are called the tennis court oaths, right? They vow at a tennis, at a royal tennis court near Versailles, which Versailles for, uh, is about, uh, Versailles is about 20 miles outside of Paris, right? So the king's primary residence was isolated from what was actually going on in the city. So they gather at the tennis court at Versailles and they vow to write a new constitution. Then on the 14th of July in the same year, a group of Parisian citizens attacks a fortress called the Bastille, which um, is used as a prison, though there are very few prisoners there at the time. Uh, they free the couple of people who are still held there, and uh, they execute the commandant of the Bastille. On the 26th of August, the group that took the tennis court oath. So you know, so the, the what the people are doing and what the representative, the representatives of the third estate are doing. These are not the same people who are doing these things. They're kind of happening parallel to each other. They adopt the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen.
And, you know, this kind of keeps the people quiet for a little while, but not for very long because the underlying problems um, aren't getting resolved. Um, there's still not enough food. The economy is still shit. There's still huge unemployment. And so on the 5th of October, and this is the, this is what sparks Burke's um, reflections here. A group of Parisian market women march on Versailles, which from the center of Paris is about a six hour walk. And they're marching there like carrying infants, you know, dragging their little kids by the hand. You know, they also, they get a hold of some weapons, or there's some of their dragging cannons uh, out to Versailles. Um, <clears throat> because they've heard rumors of a royal banquet. Which, you know, just naturally, you know, sets people who are starving off, right? So there's no royal banquet happening when they get there. But they do find that the king's bakeries are full of bread that has not been shared or distributed amongst the people. And they get a little salty about it. Though not as salty as Burke suggests, right? Let's look at the way he describes this event. Can I get somebody to start reading for us on page 200, uh, the paragraph that starts with history? who keeps a durable record of all our acts. You said on 200, right? 200, yep, yeah. top of the page. History, who keeps a durable record of all our acts and exercises our awful censure of the proceedings of all sorts of sovereigns, will not forget either those events or the air of this liberal refinement and the intercourse of mankind. History will record that on the morning of the 6th of October, 1789, the king and queen of France, after a day of confusion, alarm, dismay, and slaughter, lay down under the pledged security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled melancholy repose. From this sleep, the queen was first startled by the voice of the sentinel at her door, who cried out to her to save herself by flight that this was the last proof of fidelity he could give that they were upon him and he was dead. Instantly, he was cut down. A band of cruel ruffians and assassins reeking with his blood, rushed into the chamber of the queen and pierced within hundred strokes of bayonets and poignards to bed, from which this persecuted woman had but just time to fly almost naked and through ways unknown to the murderers had escaped to seek refuge at the feet of a king and husband, not security on life for a moment. Thank you. Let's pause here for a second, right? Very dramatic. Very dramatic, right? Very evocative, right? Very dramatic. Also, didn't happen. <laughs> Right? This is not the way things went. Yeah. What actually happened was the Marquis de Lafayette, the most respected nobleman in France who had assisted in the American Revolution, went out and brokered a peace deal, like a kind of truce, with the market women. They agreed that the king and queen would come with them to Paris, and they would be held under house arrest in the royal residence in Paris, which is called the Tuileries, right? But what does this kind of sound like? Think back to things we've already looked at in this class. Where is this imagery coming from? The idea that women are below men. Okay, that's part of it, right? Yeah, <laughs> that yeah, that, that that you know, clearly, you know, a, a woman cannot protect herself, right, and needs to be protected, right? But let's think back a little bit to our last class session, right? What does this kind of look like? Like, what literary genre does this resemble? It looks like the Gothic terror and like yeah. someone had wrote this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. This, this, this is it a Gothic novel like, situation. Go it ahead. It's like the monk. Like yeah. when he was in her chamber in Antonia, Antonia. Yeah. Kind of room, like the little that. Yeah, we have the invasion of the virtuous woman's bedchamber, right? right? the kind of sexualized violence of the bayonets stabbing the bed, right? And, you know, the, the poor woman has to flee through a secret passage, you know, to get away from her tormentors. Yeah, this is the Gothic all over. And 
remember that the response that the Gothic was supposed to evoke was a kind of pleasurable terror, right? And that's exactly what Burke is doing here. He's using the literary techniques that would have been well known among readers in the 1790s in Britain. His, you know, his audience is Britain, it's not French people, obviously. Um, to get them to feel that the revolution in France is this kind of gothic horror show, right? So he's giving them this kind of um, you know, titillating but horrifying imagery. And Mary Wollstonecraft calls him out on it, right? This is like one of her basic arguments against Burke here, right? So let's move over to the to Wollstonecraft piece here now. Like, so what, what did you get out of Wollstonecraft's arguments? So first off, how is she responding to Burke? What accusations does she make about Burke? Or how does she address his arguments? Start off like the first paragraph is like she took him as a joke. Uh huh. Cause, okay. <laughs> um, she said she was reading more for amusement than information. Uh huh. Um, she questioned his ability as a writer. Uh huh. Basically saying he's overdramatic. Yeah. He's okay. Exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's let's look at. Uh, the part that begins, uh, like right, right after, like a letter to the right honorable Edmund Burke. Can somebody start with the what says "Sir" here at the bottom of page two hundred four? I can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sir, it is not necessary, with courtly insincerity, to apologize to you for thus intruding on your precious time, nor to profess that I think it an honor to discuss an important subject with a man whose literary abilities have raised him to notice in the state. I have not yet learned to twist my periods, nor in the equival uh, um, idiom of politeness to disguise my sentiments and imply what I should be afraid to utter. If, therefore, in the course of this epistle I chance to express contempt and even indignation with some emphasis, I beseech you to believe that it is not a flight of fancy, for truth and morals has ever appeared to me the essence of the sublime, and in taste, simplicity, the only criterion of the beautiful. Okay, let's pause here for a second, right? So, by mentioning here the sublime and the beautiful, what is she indicating here? What is she referencing? Why does she specifically talk, mention the sublime and the beautiful? Is oh. this word? Um, yes, she's demonstrating familiarity yeah. with the work that Burke would have been best known for. Yes, she said, "Yeah, I've I've read your shit, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I know your theories, right?" And <clears throat> this all kind of ties in with the larger argument she's subtly making, or maybe not so subtly in this part of the piece, right? For example, like, what does she claim has brought Burke to notice in the state? His literary abilities, yes. Why do you think she says this specifically? He was also a politician, he was a member of parliament. So why does she say it's his literary abilities that have brought him to notice in the state? What does she subtly denigrate? His political per like ideas were yeah, worthless. Yeah. It's like we all know you're good at making shit up, right? <laughs> Your literary abilities are noteworthy, right? You're a good writer. I have not yet learned to twist my periods, nor in the equivocal idiom of politeness to disguise my sentiments. So what is she what is she telling him that he knows how to do that she doesn't? Yeah. Her tongue. <laughs> she <fights. laughs> yeah. She's saying, I don't know how to lie like you. Right. Right. <laughs> you have learned to disguise all of your sentiments and the flimsiness of your arguments under fancy words and complicated sentences. And I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to. 
And I think, you know, this is also, um, like if we go back for a second um, to Burke, to page 202, there's a paragraph that starts, but now all is to be changed. Can someone read that for us? But now all is to be changed. All the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life, and which by a bland assimilation incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns and the understanding gratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation, are to be exploded as a ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. Okay, so th thank you. So what does what is Burke telling us here that he likes? What does he think is good? Morals. Okay, and but let's think about how he describes morals here, right? Does he describe morality as something that arises from human nature? What does human nature look like to him? Well, he even mentioned that he sees like defects in human yeah, nature. Yeah, in our naked, shivering nature, right? So he describes human nature as being like an ugly, naked, shivering human body, right? And what does that body need? The fine drapery of life. Yeah, pulled from the wardrobe, right? All yeah. the pleasing illusions, right? So we need all of this pomp and circumstance, um, all of these fantasies overlaid onto our nature in order to make us behave ourselves. Otherwise, we're like those screaming people running into Marie Antoinette's bedchamber with bayonets, right? And this is exactly the kind of language, exactly the kind of idea that Wollstonecraft is pushing back against, right? That human beings need pleasing illusions and fantasies of wealth and aristocracy in order to be good or to live good lives, right? So I want to point you to page 207. And I'll read this, right? So, but among all your plausible arguments and witty illustrations, this is the bottom of the page, your contempt for the poor always appears conspicuous and rouses my indignation. The following paragraph in particular struck me as breathing the most tyrannic spirit and displaying the most factitious feelings. Good order is the foundation of all good things. To be able to acquire, the people, without being servile, must be tractable and obedient. The magistrate must have his reverence, the law is their authority. The body of the people must not find the principles of natural subordination by art rooted out of their minds. They must respect that property of which they cannot partake. They must labor to obtain by labor what can be obtained. And when they find, as they commonly do, the success disproportioned to the endeavor, they must be taught their consolation in the final proportions of eternal justice. So what is Burke doing in this passage that Wollstonecraft quotes here? What two groups is he linking together in league against the poor? If you can't have a good and comfortable life in this world, where is Burke telling you you can have it? Like in the afterlife, so you can your religion yeah. and like the rich or the aristocracy. Yeah, what Wollstonecraft is arguing is that Burke's pro-aristocracy arguments and the way he links the church and the nobility together, right, intend to deny the poor comfort in this world by selling them on the idea that things will be better in the next one, right? If you're good and you behave yourself and you don't make trouble in this world, things will be okay for you after you die, right? 
<laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and that's exactly what her opinion of this is, right? She, you know, she says in the next paragraph, this is contemptible, hard-hearted sophistry in the specious form of humility and submission to the will of heaven. It is, sir, possible to render the poor happier in this world without depriving them of the consolation which you gratuitously grant them in the next, right? So the fact that you know, they can have you know, a good afterlife doesn't mean they can't also have a good right. before life. <laughs> so <clears throat> the last thing I want, we're um, running short on time here, the last thing I want to focus on is this next to last paragraph here in Wollstonecraft. Can I get somebody uh, to read for us, starting with, I know indeed that there is often something disgusting. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kate. I know indeed that there is often something disgusting in the distresses of poverty at which the imagination revolts and starts back to exercise itself in the more attractive archaea of fiction. The rich man builds a house, art and taste gives it the highest finish. His gardens are planted and the trees grow to recreate the fancy of the planter. Though the temperature of this climate may rather force him to avoid the dangerous dance they exhale than, than seek the umbrageous. It means shadowy. Okay, yeah. retreat. Everything on the estate is cherish, cherish, <laughs> but man. Yet to contribute to the happiness of man is the most sublime of all enjoyments. But if instead of sweeping pleasure grounds of Obelisks, obelisks, obelisk, yeah. temples, and elegant cottages as objects for the eye, the heart was allowed to be true to nature. Decent forms would be scattered over the estate and plenty smile around. Instead of the poor being subject to the gripping hand of an avaricious steward, mm -hmm. they would be watched over with fatherly solicitude by the man whose duty and pleasure it was to guard their happiness and shield from rapacity the beings who, by the sweat of their brow, exalted him above his fellows. So I just want to quickly show you some images of the sort of thing Wollstonecraft is referring to here, right? So there's a trend in 18th century landscaping towards what are called Gothic follies. So here we have an example. So what does this look like? A castle? Yeah, it looks looks like a castle. Does it look like a castle in a usable state? <laughs> yeah, it looks like a ruined castle, right? But if you look at the bricks, they don't look old enough for it to be a real ruin, right? right. So this is decorative landscaping that a rich person constructed on their property. Like the image, like the like a garden, like a big garden. Yeah, yeah. She talks. Yeah, she talks also like gardens with exotic plants, right? You know, here we have another example. You know, this is you know somebody built a fake medieval tower on their property. And here is you know a little hermit's cottage, right? You know, it looks you know like it's like it looks sort of like a hobbit, but like you're expecting Bilbo Baggins to keep from shuffling out of this. And some of them were made to look um, like Indian or Chinese um, buildings, right? So here we have a fake Chinese pagoda here built in someone's garden. Now, what is Wollstonecraft arguing these rich folks could be doing instead of building these Gothic follies? Does she think this is a good use of land? What could they be doing instead? Like giving the land to the people who are actually farming on it. Yeah. They could raise food on the land, right? They don't have to plant all these exotic flowers that you have to work real hard to keep alive in England's cold, wet climate anyway, right? You don't have to build these fancy castles and towers, right? If you actually want to cherish human beings and human life rather than your own private enjoyment, she's arguing, then what you ought to do is cultivate the land, 
right, grow things on it. Now, this is actually part of a political debate that's going on in England at the time as well that I'm just going to briefly mention because it's going to come back again when we talk about Romanticism more specifically. Starting in the 1770s, there's a series of what are called enclosure acts. I think the first one is passed in 1773. And prior to this, if you lived in an English village, and wouldn't it be nice to live in an English village? You know, it would be arranged sort of like this, right? So you have got people's houses, kind of in a vague kind of ring around a large public space, which was referred to as a village green. And everybody in the village was entitled to use this common property, right? So it's a village green or village commons. Everybody, like if you have a cow or a sheep, you can graze them on it. Um, you can, you know, raise some vegetable crops for subsistence, you know, that sort of thing, right? And then um, the aristocrats who owned the land started thinking this wasn't really a very productive use economically of the village green. So what they did was start building fences around the village green and using them for grazing live, grazing large numbers of livestock. This was one of the factors that started pushing English people out of the country into cities, right? They couldn't subsist in the traditional ways anymore, so they had to move to cities for factory work at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right? So I think that Wollstonecraft is also taking a swipe here at landlords who have all of these grounds, or all of these acres and acres of land that they're just building pleasure gardens on while they're taking away the village commons from the tenants who live in their villages. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Everybody still with me, everybody get me. Okay, so um, I will give you, uh, I will let you know when the quiz is posted, um, it, should, it should post Friday morning. You will have until Sunday night to complete it. Um, at least for this first one, if you forget, I might send you a gentle reminder, right? But uh, yeah, just try to remember that unless I tell you otherwise, there will be a vocab quiz every, due every Sunday. All right, so let me give you all the reading questions for next time when we will be talking about the Napoleonic Wars fun shit. And how those are um, <clears throat> how those are portrayed in English poetry. for this as well. I just I forgot to print it out before class.